Beauty is here. 
so thankful we have this country where we can be free. So we're just so thankful for that. We're so thankful y'all are all here today to celebrate our graduates and just please worship with us this morning.
Today, we honor the men and women who have died in service to our country. Our debt to the heroic men and valiant women in the service of our country can never be repaid. They have earned our undying gratitude. America will never forget their sacrifices. For love of country, they accepted death. And they who for their country die shall fill an honored grave. For glory lights the soldier's tomb, and beauty weeps the brave. It is foolish and wrong to mourn the men who die. Rather, we should thank God that such men lived. God bless the families of these men and women, and God bless America. This morning as we gather here, we're recognizing a new beginning, and we're celebrating some glorious ends. There are men and women here today who have been touched by the sacrifices of friends, family, and loved ones. All of us here have been touched by the country, by the freedom, by the things that we enjoy that have been preserved for us by the bravery and the sacrifices of those who lie in honored rest. So this morning as we celebrate our graduates, let us also remember those who have put their life on the line so that we can celebrate. And let us never forget that it is because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that all of us are able to pray that, uh, that we will be rejoined with those who have sacrificed and gone before us. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together as believers, as those who treasure your word and treasure the sacrifice of those who have gone before us. But most of all, Lord, we treasure the sacrifice of your son who has bought our freedom. Lord, we, uh, we pray that there are those who will be comforted today in their loss. We pray that there will be strengthened with your presence. And we pray that all of us, all of us, will more clearly understand what has been done for us and continues to be done for us by those who wear the uniform. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, and thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.
okay, folks, June 14th, 7 o'clock, right here. You're going to get another... That's what happens when the second team plays. Me, not her. Right here, June 14th, 7 o'clock, you're going to have another sample of what you enjoyed this morning, that great live band. Aren't they great? Yeah. Come back and enjoy a second helping. We welcome everyone here this morning, but we particularly welcome our special guests, those of you who might be visiting with us. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd spend just a moment to fill out one of the response cards that you find in the seat backs. You can also uh, stop by out in the Welcome Center at the Hub and let us know that you were here. Uh, you can even uh, fill out a response card on the app. So we'd uh, love to know that you were here. Uh, this morning, uh, we're about to receive our offering, and it is because of your generosity and, and gifts that everything that happens here at Argyle is supported. And we can't tell you how much we appreciate the loving generosity of each one of you. Uh, you can uh, come up, uh, drop your offering in the uh, bucket, and remember, we've got a little something for you, candy. Yeah, you can eat it right here in church. Uh, you can also uh, use our app or our online giving. Um, if you have any questions about that, check with us out at the Hub, and we'll be happy to help you get set up. So you know, spend a few minutes, uh, fellowship with those around you, uh, grab a piece of candy, and we'll continue our worship in a moment.
Good morning. How are y'all? So we are celebrating the seniors today, and Justin's going to be my Vanna White. So we did a little care package thing for the, and we like had a list, and I kept adding things at the store, so it's pretty hilarious. Is there a specific order? No order. No order. And this is Austin, so he's going to have to put it all back in there. Yes. All right. So when you're hungry late at night, a bag of ramen noodles. Yes. They are worms. A bag of earplugs, because you never know who your roomie is going to be. Wet ones. Be clean at all times. There's another clean thing in here. Gum, because you don't want no stank breath. Yes. What are those? Do not eat them. These are to remind you to wash your clothes, please. Be clean. And a renews it air freshener because your room is going to stink anyway. Yes. And for that little midnight quickie, you need a little Mountain Dew. It's always a good one. Uh, and a $10 buck card. Because you're going to need some of that extra kick. And then there's a card. A card. She, he did that well. And then a book. Um, Justin found this book, and it sounds like a really, I've read some of it. It sounds like a really great book about, and whoever's calling me can stop. Is somebody in here. And I know y'all. Anyway, a different college experience. How to be a believer. And we're going to talk about that a little bit about that today. So. There you go. Now, huh? Yeah. Come up here, seniors, real quick. Yes. You thought I was kidding when I said I was going to make you come up here, but I'm not kidding. Austin, this one's yours. Whoops. Oh. That's definitely yours. Do not open that can. Do Get not your Mountain open Dew that intern. can. You can have it. So these are our leaders, our amazing leaders who keep us on track, and they're going to hand out the, the bags. We'll send my help in. These are cheap, by the way. You can get, like, a whole case. A whole case for a buck fifty, so, yeah. Who's that for? Oh. Okay, cool. All right, thank y'all. I was going to make y'all speak, but no, I didn't think so. I think Olivia wants to speak. Who? Olivia. Olivia, come here. No, she ain't going to speak. So we have wonderful leader. And notice how she didn't even put her sister's card in an envelope. That's kind of embarrassing, but that's what sisters do. All right, y'all can leave now. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so we have limited time, so y'all are going to have to listen quickly. All right? Are you going to stand or sit? I don't know. I might do a little bit of both. I'm, I'm going to do both, Okay. I'm sure. So. All right. Um, so I'll start us off a little bit here. We have been going through this series called We Are um, with our student ministry, and we decided that this last session was so important that we wanted you all to hear it as well. Um, how many of you went and saw Avengers Endgame? Yes. I, yeah, no spoilers. No spoilers. Because I heard someone, like, shouted a spoiler as they were leaving the theater, and then they got jumped for it. I don't want to be that guy. Um, so, yeah, no spoilers here. But, if you, you know, whether you saw Endgame or if you've seen any other movie recently, uh, especially down here at the uh, Epic Theater, when you go to buy your seats, typically you look at the chart and you're like, okay, these seats are taken, these seats are open. I don't want to sit next to anybody I don't know because they could smell weird. They could talk during the movie, which that is the worst. We had someone sit next to us in Endgame, and I said to Kaylee, I'm about to scream because they would not stop talking, and they were ruining my movie. But anyway, so a lot of times with this movie theater experience, we like to be together with people, but we don't want to be with them, right? We like to have our space. 
And a lot of times our church experience is the exact same way. We like to be with people, but we don't want to have to interact with them. We want to come to church. We want to just hear uh, a, a few minutes on, on some, some good words from the Bible, and then we want to go home. Um, but this series, we've been discussing a, a big idea. What we do with our series is we have something for each series that says, okay, if you learn one thing, you're going to answer this question by the end. So our big idea for the series is why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? And then the big question today is we're going to talk about the church, and we're going to see why we meet together. Why is this important? Why is it important that every Sunday we come at either 9 or 10.30, or if you're really spiritual, you come to both? You serve at one, you go to the other one? We talked about serving as well uh, in this series. So, you know, the, the super spiritual ones do both of those. There's supposed to be laughter there. There we go. There we go. We can just enter the laugh track online. But anyway, um, you know, why are we here? Why do we meet together? So I have some good verses that we're going to answer that question. So I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. I'm going to read them all. I'm going to talk about a few. Justin's going to talk about a few. So buckle up. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus... He has inaugurated for us a new living way through the curtain, that is, through the flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And here are our key, key verses. Let us hold to the confessions of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works not neglecting together the gathering together as some are in habit of doing but encourage each other and but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching so I got the first three ones there and then Justin's gonna go off I saw his notes he's gonna go off on the last one verse so here we go. Actually, just the last phrase of the verse. Yeah, the last phrase of the last verse. And I believe, I might be jumping the gun here, but I believe you're going to talk to the students. Correct. And then church people, y'all got me. Yes. So students, and there's a lot of y'all in here. So the phrase without wavering, what do you think that means, without wavering? Without wavering means you have to know what you believe and why you believe it. Because if you don't, somebody's going to convince you of something else. This is important. When you go, to, especially going off to college, um, there's some great things at college, but there's also some pretty bad stuff going on in colleges. And they will, oh, the pranks and all that, that's cool, that's part of it. But, you know, you have to know what you believe because you're going to have professors that are going to challenge you, challenge your faith. They're going to be professors are going to call you an idiot if you think you're a believer said you're 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 just you don't know anything you're just stupid so you have to you have to know how to how to counter that in this world you will hear and see a lot of things that seem good but they look good the appearance is good but they're contrary to what God says and by the way I'm always going to what God says because you need a foundation if nothing else you hear today, you need a foundation. So when you hit the campus in the summer, who are going A and B in the summer or in the fall, you need to have a foundation, something you can stand on, regardless of what any professor or any other student or any other club. There are some strange clubs on campus. Just saying. My daughter goes to UNF, and there's some bizarre stuff. It's entertaining, but bizarre. So, Proverbs 26, 27 says, There is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end is the way to death. So the wisest man who ever lived says, What you're going to see may seem right, but it leads to death. Because it's not true. And we need to know exactly what we believe and why we believe it. We need to, here, here's a clear thing, key thing here. We need to know what God says and not what others say. God said. It's easy for me to say, and, and Pastor Rick will tell you the same thing, don't take my word for it. Just because I say something's true, 
search it. Go to the scripture and find out. See what it says. Because I could tell you something, you know, Jim Jones, the Kool-Aid man, he started out with truth, a little bit of truth, and then he went off the wagon and people believed him because they didn't know what they believed. It's important. It's very key. The only way to know this for yourself is to be in the word, prayer, and around others to help you grow, which leads to the next part, the next verse. It says, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. Watch out. What does that mean? Ever heard the phrase, I'm my brother's keeper, or I'm not my brother's keeper? You are your brother's keeper. In Genesis 4 and 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is, your, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So God asked a simple question. Cain gave a snarky reply. Very snarky. Do you think God knew where his brother was? Of course he did. He's God. Do you think he knew what happened to his brother? Of course he knew. He wanted to confront him. He wanted to confront him and say, do you know what you've really done? Do you, do, do, do you not understand? He, he understood. He wanted him to understand that he was his brother's keeper, that he's responsible for keeping up. And by the way, he was the older brother, so it would have been even more responsibility. So he, he basically dropped the ball, and he got mad at his brother and killed him. So that's even worse. Jesus said it this way in John 13, 34 through 35. I give you a new command. And by the way, we read over that, but to the Jewish people, the only person who could give a new command is who? It's God. So for Jesus to say, I give you a new command, he's saying to his disciples, I'm God. It's a big deal. He says, a new command, I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You are to also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not by if you go to church. Not by if you read your Bible. None of that. That we love each other. That's how the world will know. We will be so attractive in our love for each other that the world's going to ask us, why are you so weird? Why do you love each other like that? Good one. Jesus is saying that we're to keep up with each other, not to point out faults, which we are to, we hold each other accountable, but to encourage and lift up. At college, you're going to need somebody to have your back, spiritually as, as well as other ways. Study partners, all that stuff. Make good grades, please. Your parents will appreciate it. They're paying good money for that school, so you better make good grades. So the next part, not neglecting. Worshiping Jesus together may be the single most important thing we do. Let me read that again. Worshiping Jesus together may be the single most important thing we do. You ever thought about that? This, the corporate worship, may be the single most important thing we do. It may not seem like it. Like Justin said at the beginning, we kind of come in, check our box, and do our ditty, and then we go home for the week. This is important. Scripture clearly calls us to gather together as a body, as a little C, as the church, as part of the big C, the big church. In his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life, Don Whitney says it this way. There's an element of worship in Christianity that cannot be experienced in private worship or by watching worship. There are some graces and blessings that God gives only to the meeting together with other believers. That's huge. That is huge. There are some blessings and graces that God only gives when you meet together. I mean, you say, well, I can worship God fishing. Well, you can. But what are you missing because of not joining together with your fellow believers? It's a big deal. I think God says that clearly there. So don't try and be the Lone Ranger. God did not wire us that way. He, he wired us to be in community. This is community. We come here on Sunday mornings, either service, 
You've been in a life group. You connect. You grow. You mature. That's what being a Christian is. That's what being a follower of Christ is. You'll find a myriad of faith-based activities on your average campus. I mean, more than you can shake a stick at. So I suggest you find a Bible-teaching church at that campus if you're going away out of town. Find a church. Find a good one. Connect there. Serve there. Grow there. There's other faith-based activities on, on campus that you should get plugged into. And, I mean, you could go on. I mean, like the big campuses, it's crazy. There's hundreds. And you need to find one that truly teaches the word and plug into it so that you are not alone. So I want to focus on just the last part of Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 25. In fact, 25b, if, uh, if you grew up in a Southern Baptist church, this is how we divided, this is how we divided up uh, verses. Uh, yeah, there we go. So uh, the last part here says, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. And this is really my sticking point. If you remember something from today, church people, if you remember one sentence, I want this to be it. Our job is to encourage the next generation. Our job is to encourage the next generation. Why is this so important? Why is it important that we, you know, basically break the cycle? Because especially if you're on any type of social media, you hear nothing but the, the older generations complaining about the younger generations, right? Some of you that are in the younger generations, millennials and Gen Z, millennials are about to not be in the younger generations anymore, and that makes me a little sad because um, I'm in that group. But uh, millennials and Gen Z, all you hear on social media, all you see are these stupid little videos from baby boomers and Gen X about how the millennials are terrible, how Gen Z is terrible. Some of you baby boomers and Gen X are like, well, they are terrible. Well, guess what? So were you when you were their age. <laughs> I'm not angry. <laughs> but anyway, our job is to encourage the next generation. As my generation gets to this point to where Gen Z is coming up and then whatever comes after Gen Z, our job is to basically end that cycle your job, whatever generation you're in, is to go ahead and end the cycle. Say that, you know what, instead of putting down the next generation, instead of belittling the generation below me for what they don't do, what if I started encouraging the things that they do? And what if I started giving them tools and resources to improve those areas where they lack? I'll tell you, I, I have, oh, I'm going to save that story. I'm going to save that story for later. Um, but I wanted to use this line because I am a huge, huge Marvel fan. Why is this so important? Because we are in the end game now. Man, y'all are a tough crowd. <laughs> Thank you. I know my jokes aren't that funny, but please give me a sympathy laugh. I enjoy these things. They help my ego. My ego gets badly damaged sometimes. My son doesn't laugh at my jokes. <laughs> but anyway, we are in the end game. This is so important for us. It's important for us to make sure that the next generation knows that we're there for them, that we're there to support them. Why is this so important? Because LifeWay Research has actually done a lot of study on this. LifeWay Research, research uh, did this huge study about 15 years ago called Why Students Leave the Church. And then two years ago, they decided to redo the study. They did the same parameters that they did 15 years ago. If you want to find the whole study, because there's about 25 pages worth of research and graphs and charts and all the things that I love, but a lot of people probably think are boring. Um, but if you're into that kind of stuff, just Google it or ask me for a link. I'll send it to you. Why students leave the church? These are the results from two years ago. And a lot of times we think, what do we think? We think our, are their friends convinced them not to go. We think, I don't know what we think, because I wasn't part of the people that left the church. Right? That is an amen. Um, but number one, I moved to college and stopped att attending church. I think all four of our seniors are moving away. No, one of them is still in Jacksonville, but she's moving away from home. Nope, no, she's not. <laughs> She ain't leaving that cush. Forget that. 
I don't blame you. Stay at home. It's much easier. People cook for you. Um, so anyway, three of our four, so 75% of our seniors are moving away to college. The number one reason why people stop attending church is because they moved away. We're going to get to how we can fix that in a minute. Number two, and this one really um, sticks with me, church members. Church members seem judgmental or hypocritical. And this isn't something that they just start thinking as they get into college. This is something that they think all through the youth group. Church members seem judgmental or hypocritical. Number three, I didn't feel connected to my church. I didn't feel connected to my church. And number four, this is another sticking point with me. People that know me very, very well know that I have some personal guardrails against this. And if you want to know what I do about this, then feel free to come talk to me. But I disagreed with my church's stance on political issues. I disagreed with my church's stance on political issues. And let me tell you, I, I heard this quote about uh, two years ago by a guy named Dr. Brent Crow. Um, he, he's part of an organization that basically teaches students how to be leaders, uh, whether they go into the church or go into a corporate world. And he said, our faith is not in an elephant and it's not in a donkey. Our faith is in a lamb. And so what we do, and I'm, I, I'm not going to stick here because this isn't the point, but what we do a lot of times is we put our faith in that color red or we put our faith in that color blue. And what we're doing when we do that is we alienate half of society. Well, if they believe in this, can they really be a Christian? They may be a new Christian. They may be a growing Christian. That might be something that they're still learning. Or maybe they just have a different viewpoint. Maybe the Bible doesn't even talk about that issue. Just think about all that. I'm going to move on. The room got quiet. But here's a question. I love asking questions. Okay, my generation is all about asking why, right? It's what people make fun of us for. We asked why too much as kids, and now the next generation is asking why even when they can't actually say the word why, a.k.a. my son Lucas. Um, but uh, what is the faith of the next generation worth? What is the faith of the next generation worth? Seeing those statistics, seeing those reasons why people leave the church, what is the faith of the next generation worth? And I'll tell you this. You won't find people that will fight for students more than these two people up here. And again, I, I, have, a, I have a story that goes into why I believe all of this so passionately, but I'm saving it for the end of my time. What is the faith of the next generation worth? I made a list. Again, I'm a list person. I made a list of some things that it's worth sacrificing. Okay? If the faith of the next generation is important, here are some things that we can sacrifice as, as believers, things that we can sacrifice as a church here, as a church community across, you know, the, the individual church lines. It is worth giving up complaints about the next generation. Amen. No one else amen, so I will. Complaints about the next generation. Number two, the church budgets so our students and kidmen environments can excel. Let me tell you, if student ministry and kids ministry isn't the most important thing in a church, then that church is wrong. And I'm so glad that we have a church and a pastor that believes that the next generation is worth so much. Because that is what our church is all about. That's what this faith is all about. Number three, personal worship music preference once a month, right? People know that the Alive Band plays once a month, and there are people that don't come every single time. It's the truth. They're not here today. It is, it is their loss. I might be a little partial, but I think it's good. Um, 
But listen, I love, our, I love the, the fact that we have so many different worship styles represented in just the way that we do music, and we do that so that we can reach different people. So if one week is not your personal worship style, then get over it. Number four. <laughs> personal preaching preference because that style doesn't work anymore. Okay? I grew up in a Baptist church, right? When I went to student ministry, it was all about that three-point outline. Not two, not four. It was a three-point outline. And let me tell you, I have nothing against a three-point outline, but for students today, it doesn't work. And so if you come sit in on a middle school ministry night, you'll see that I have one point. And guess what I've noticed as I've changed to that one point? I have to study harder, and I have to know my Bible more. I have to know what it says more because I have to get these verses down to one point instead of saying, okay, there's this point over here, there's this point over here, there's this point over here. What's the whole thing saying? And so a lot of times we say, okay, well, the preaching style, whether that's Pastor Rick or whether that's me or whether that's David, maybe that preaching style may not be your style, but maybe it's not working anymore. And maybe that's why we have to change. Number five, this one I put in for me. Uh, it's worth sacrificing your Friday night on June 14th to come to a worship event put on by the Alive Band. Yes. It, we're going to be in that next room right over there, Family Life Center. There's going to be some haze. There's going to be some lights. Kenny's probably going to jump four feet in the air. Austin's probably going to do some move over in the side. My favorite is when he does this. I love Austin. Austin's been my intern this year and has done a phenomenal job, and so that's why I pick on him. Yes. So, again, what is the faith of the next generation worth? And it can be worth just these few things, but I think if you want to just narrow it down to one word, it's worth everything. The faith of the next generation is worth so much. And it's time that we as a church really recognize that because they are the future. At some point, there's going to be a Gen Z person that takes my place. At some point, there's going to be a Gen Z person that takes David's place, that takes Pastor Rick's place, that takes Hal's place, that takes Kaylee's place. I think that's all the main people. If I forgot someone, I'm sorry. My mother-in-law, Donna. Someone's going to take her place, too. <laughs> so, the faith of the next generation is worth everything. Here's where we're going to solve some things, okay? I'm not just putting out doom and gloom because we're encouraging each other, right? We're not just saying, okay, here's the problems. Here's how we're going to fix it. How you can partner with the next generation, okay? Even if you just do one of these four things, it's so important it'll make a difference. Number one, listen to them. Number one, listen to them. They have ideas. They have opinions. They have things that you won't agree with, but just listen to them. Number two, invest in them. Again, my story that I'm going to tell in just a second really goes into that investment. Invest in them. Number three, pray over them. This is the easiest one that you can do. When you're at home, just think about the names of some of our students. If you don't know the names of our students, come talk to us. We'd be glad to give you some of our students' names that you can pray for. And number four, be around them. Let me tell you, bless our high school and middle school and kids ministry volunteers. Yes. Because they don't get paid to do the things that we do. They, get, they have to come in here. They come in early sometimes. They sacrifice some of their Sunday afternoons. They sacrifice uh, a week of work to go to camp. They sacrifice so much for these kids. And they're making a huge difference. I want to tell you about two of these people that made a difference in, in a young boy's life. Um, I knew of a guy who, who grew up in church, um, grew up in church, family, loved Jesus, talked about it all the time at home. And as he got into student ministry, he started to rebel a little bit, which teenagers do. And um, this student 
had a small group leader, and he had a youth pastor who really, who really invested in him. Um, even though he didn't really want to be there. In fact, sometimes he would just skip altogether. Um, but when he was there, they would try to bring him into conversation. And so one day, the youth pastor is actually sitting in the small group with them, and he says, you know, how do you, how do you feel about this? And, he, and the boy said, I don't care. I don't care. I'm not going to answer. You can't make me answer. And then that boy actually walked out and didn't even finish the, uh, the small group time. Went and hid in another part of the church until church was over. And so the next day, the student pastor and the small group leader show up at his school, and he gets a, a note that says, come to the office. And he's trying to figure out what, what's going on, what he did. And they're sitting there, he's saying, no, I don't want to talk to them. And so they say, hey, let's go to lunch. They get him out of his Spanish class, they go to lunch, and um, just have some fun together. You know, listen to the music that he liked to listen to, talked about the sports and interests that he had. And the change wasn't immediate, but some change happened in that boy's life. And a lot of the change that happened came from that student pastor and came from that small group leader. And that student is actually sitting up here today. Let me tell you. Small group leaders make a difference. They make a difference. Because without them, I'm not here. So, church, our main point, I'm so sorry, I went over my time. I knew this would happen. Um, main point, our students need you in their lives. They need you in their lives. Because the faith of this next generation is worth everything. All right, so I get to close. So I'm going to stand up so they can move all this stuff off here. So the bottom line, we are better together. You may not believe it, but it's true. You may not, Scripture says it. I'm going with that. We are better together. How many things can we do better when we're as a group? A lot. Proverbs 27, 17. I know you've probably heard this verse. I looked it up, and then I looked it up. What it literally means, and it's pretty interesting. Iron sharpens iron. One person sharpens another. Sounds kind of weird. It literally means a man sharpens his friend's face. Kenny, do not try. I saw you could do not try that, Kenny. Do not sharpen my face. Do you hear what he's saying there? Our job, our responsibility is to sharpen each other's face. Our responsibility is to be in each other's life and love them, encourage them, grow them. Be there for them because this generation needs your wisdom. That's one thing they do not have. They have a lot of questions, and a lot of questions are great. I love hearing the questions because it makes you think. A lot of us don't like to think either. We like our way and no other way. But they need your wisdom. Wisdom comes with age. Wisdom comes with experience. They don't have that. And who are they going to get it from if it's not you? If you're not going to speak into their lives and love them and listen to them and be with them and encourage them, become a leader. No? Okay. I, I, had some, I had to tell the story. I had somebody who wanted to be a leader. They came in 30 minutes later. They walked out. I'm like, what were you expecting? They're high school kids. They don't listen, and they run around, and they scream, and they go crazy. That's what they do. So I read this blog, and I thought it was very um, appropriate to what we're talking about. This lady's name is Megan Parasso, and here's what she wrote. Relationships at one point meant only hanging out when it was convenient for me or if I had nothing better to do. In other words, when I was bored, I would hang out with people. I would do my Sunday morning thing, and that was it. After coming, it's, she's writing about her church. After, only after coming into our church and sitting under godly counsel 
and teaching did I realize how important relationships really are. Now when I look at what I've built my life, the people around me are what define much of it. In other words, she thought she was all a Lone Ranger. Once she got into godly counsel and teaching, she understood that now they're making her something that she was not before. Godly relationships, especially ones within our respective church body, will take us to new levels of intimacy with Jesus. They will keep us humble and understanding of our calling. They will challenge us in ways we da- we wouldn't dare challenge ourselves. We often put so much emphasis on God's will for our life and what he wants us to do. Sometimes all he is wanting us to do is seek godly counsel from those who are on the track who have a track record and will give us a straight answer. This generation is looking for people who's been there, done that, have the scars, speak into their lives. You may not know them. Like Justin said, pray for them. These kids going off to college away, it's tough out there. Those of you who went to college can say, yeah, it's tough out there. Pray for them. Get their email address. No, they won't ever answer an email. Get, get their phone number. Oh, even better, write them a card and send it to them snail mail freaks them out because they don't know what it is I'm telling you it works but how many people like to get a handwritten note by someone does it mean more than a text and trust me they say nah it doesn't but it really does so send them something we are truly better together God created us to be together in unity to encourage each other to lift each other up to point out issues to confront, to love, to motivate, all those things. And we're missing it when we don't be the body that God has called us to be.
David and the seniors would come down front. We um, we want to just take a moment to to pray over our seniors. Chop chop, we're already over. Um, if you want to partner with these seniors and just commit to just praying for them. If you could say that all I'm going to do, you know, at the least, I'm going to pray for the students. If you would come down front, put a hand on one of the shoulders. If you can't get to them, put the hand on the shoulder of someone uh, around them. We're going to make the seniors very uncomfortable because a lot of them are super introverted and don't like things like this. <laughs> David, do you want to pray for them? Father, we're honored to be able to do what we do, to watch students grow and mature, to go through the babies and the toddler and the elementary and these middle school and high school, and to watch them graduate, Father. It's an exciting time. It's also um, can be a sad time. 
salt and light for you. That people will be attracted to them by their love. And that they would seek you with all that they are. That you give them clear direction and guidance. Because you do not um, want them to just wander around aimlessly. That they have to find you and to seek you through your word, through prayer, through connecting with another church or this church to keep connected with Justin and I. And I just pray over them right now that your Holy Spirit would move in their lives and radically change them. Give them the knowledge and the ability to do well in school and they apply themselves. And we know that you will honor that. Thank you for this day and these seniors. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you cry? Are you tearing no, up? You're tearing up. We done. Y'all have a great holiday. Don't get sunburned. Stay in the air conditioning. The wind is strong. The water's deep.